You don't have to worry about that. Bedford Reader articles, you, you got your quiz tomorrow. You're going to be here in the morning? Okay, and so you'll be okay with that stuff. Um, what pages are those? It's like 6, 596. <laughs> six, six, sure, you go ahead. You, you, you 566. Five, six, six. Five, six. The second one. It's 560. Just look up the there's, there's, there's a thing called like the table of contents or an index that you can take a look at. But I don't know what the table of passages Well, yeah, then if you look up that daily agenda, you can take a look at that dangerous. thing and you would know. So. <laughs> You would know that they're on page 560 and 566. and 566. And again, there are questions in the middle, like in between the two, but I'm not expecting you to, to, to go through those. I just want you to read them. Um, Halloween, I'll get you <laughs> And then Monday, you got your reading check quiz um, for, for Catcher in the Rye. Some point today, it'll probably be towards the end of school, um, I'll get your essay grades into Power School. And then you'll have access to the essays through, through Turnitin. So um, if you log back into Turnitin, your assignment will be there. You click on the essay. It will still be your file, your format um, that, that you submitted. Uh, at the top, it will have your grade for it. But then all throughout it, like I'll have explanations, comments, and all that kind of stuff. So it would certainly be worth your while to go back, take a look at them, um, to see you know things that were going well, see if there's any areas of improvement. The nice thing with you having first period, if then like tomorrow or on Monday you want to go over anything with your essay, we certainly have you know, those plain minutes so that we can do that uh, or some other point. But uh, go back, take a look at the, at the essay. Um, I'm almost done with them. I would say we'll probably be averaging around usually that 81, that 82 where it kind of like to be. So it wasn't the, oh my goodness, these are so terrible um, kind of things. He did not write dictation. Your pen, like silver, lining matches up perfectly with like your breast pocket. Yeah, like three I care. Yeah. It's the little details. It's the little yeah. details that make a difference. All right, so we, all right, we did black and white reasoning. We did not do begging the question. So yeah, we got four. history exams or uh, FRQs. It'll pop up here eventually. Is when begging the question for your response question. Um, is, is when begging the question kind of starts to come up. It's also called circular reasoning. Basically, what happens with begging the question, here it is, is it's a circular argument where you restate the conclusion to sound as evidence or to sound like it's additional evidence. So, the example up here, fairly simple one. You could have everyone believes in God or Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, whatever you want, but everyone believes in God because the belief in God is universal. By saying everyone believes in God is the statement, my support for it would be, well, the belief in God is universal, which means exactly the same thing as saying everyone believes in God. So if you can think about questions that you've had in the past, um, you know, for like a short answer essay type things where name three effects from the Reconstruction period, you know, following the American Civil War, and you can only come up with one effect, well, then what do typical students tend to do? Take that one effect and try to stretch it into three things, restate it in two other additional ways so it sounds like a different answer. Um, you're trying to come up with multiple reasons you know, for, for some ideas, and you basically just start going with the same idea over and over, trying to restate it. Um, if I ever draw a picture of a dog chasing its tail on a DRQ, it probably means you're begging the question or it's a circular argument. The argument is just going around in circles over and over and over. Sometimes. That you put on your uh, test? No, I did not draw a picture of the dog. Okay. <laughs> Score might have gone higher if I had. <laughs> also, if I ever like spell anything, I'll usually make up an excuse. Like the baby knocked over the drink or slobbered on your essay. Like, oh, excuse for the baby. And it really wasn't. Do you even have like, you just exposed yourself? Oh, I did. Circular reasoning, essentially, you're just going with the same argument over and over and over again. Ben got his job at Subway. Sam got his job at Chick-fil-A. They needed references. They could reference one another. Ben would be a good reference for me. Sam would be a good reference for me. How do I know that Sam's trustworthy? Oh, I can vouch for him. How do I know Ben's trustworthy? Well, I think he's a good guy. 
basically you are endorsing the person who is going to endorse you, hence you are endorsing yourself. So that would kind of be how a begging the question is sort of their argument idea starts to work. And you're thinking about doing that now. That's actually kind of another job. Totally like lost. That's what I do. That's why my ratemyteacher.com rating is, you know, up where it is. We looked you up yeah. on Rate My Teacher. Told you, it's pretty good. I was thinking about the, the egos, pathos, and logos thing. Uh huh. And um, what was the guy that came up with again? Aristotle came up with the terms. Did he, did he like, come up with the terms because he was curious what was inside of, a, of something written that made it persuasive or, like, influenced or influenced? No, he, um, when. We said that Aristotle was like a uh, student of Plato. Yeah. When it comes to like purposes of stuff, Pla Plato's main concern was truth with a capital T. He wanted to try to figure out what makes people what they are, who yeah. they are, and all that kind of stuff. So he thought that rhetoric persuasion got in the way of all that, muddled that, because you were looking more at a, at a uh, trying to sway human emotions. You weren't dealing with reality as much, was kind of his viewpoint. Aristotle is was more of a scientist, like Rene Descartes. We talk about being a philosopher, but also has a math science background. Aristotle would be more of that kind of stuff. So he was trying to figure out kind of truth more in the natural world, and so he's looking at rhetoric, persuasion, argument as a way to support theories, almost like a scientific question, you know, coming up with a hypothesis. So he was looking at it more at, at, from a validity standpoint, how can you validate arguments, and that's where he was coming up with, with those ideas. So the angles that they had toward it, the viewpoints that they had toward it were, were different enough. But, but he, there wasn't like one specific thing that he was trying to figure out with the text, but just more of a way of looking at questions that can't be answered, where you're making an argument for it, validating that whole thought process behind it. So much more scientific. Um, equivocation. This is shifting the definition of a key term within an argument. It could kind of come off as being a pun, which happens with like the second example with Amish Dutch flow, which is like furniture polish. Uh, the problem is if you don't realize you're doing it, your argument starts to um, have some issues and, and fall apart a little bit. Or what you might be trying to use as a pun, kind of sneaky form of eloquence, your audience might be able to kind of read through it and go, wait a minute, there's not really a logical argument happening here. But in equivocation, you shift the definition of the key term. More often than not, it happens by accident where you don't realize you're doing it, but you're changing the definition of something. Um, this could happen, for example, say with like a literary device. You're writing a body paragraph about, I don't know, simile. Um, and so you're writing about similes, and all of a sudden you do an example of a metaphor. And, and you have kind of shifted now what your rhetorical device was to something else, probably accidentally because you didn't notice that, that you were doing it. But you have to take, take a look at the, nothing is better than steak. So there is not a food item out there that would be better than medium rare steak. A little bit of seasoning. You don't need mushrooms and onions, just have a nice steak. However, having a hot dog is better than nothing. I would rather have a hot dog than starve to death. Nothing is better than steak. Hot dogs are better than nothing. Transitive property would therefore mean hot dogs are better than steak. Hot dogs are better than steak. And chicken are better. What happened? Yeah, the word nothing went from when we were saying nothing is better than steak, all food items in the world. Um, there is not a single one of those that I would put above a steak. But when we said hot dogs are better than nothing, hot dogs are better than the absence of food. You know, again, I would rather have a hot dog than starve. So the term nothing has shifted. So that last statement, um, therefore hot dogs are better than steak, you can't make that statement because you're changing you know, the definition of nothing. Now this would be one that certainly was done you know, purposely. Um, Amish Dutch glow, a pure and simple solution from pure and simple people. Uh, and you'll see like similar arguments when it comes to legalization of marijuana. Naturally, marijuana should be legalized throughout the United States because it is a natural substance. You kind of play off the key term, natural, pure.
pure and simple, where you're trying to kind of convince your audience to go along with you or your reader based on kind of shifting the definition of the word. Makes it sound kind of like a little cutesy. But the, the main thing would make sure that you don't kind of change what you mean or misinterpret what you mean when you're going over, um, you know, a specific kind of concept, idea, term, where now you have like two or three terms, points, arguments that you uh, end up looking at. And then uh, last one we're going to do is called ad hominem. It's an argument that attacks the character of the person rather than the argument itself. So Dr. Nicholson's advice about smoking is worthless. He's known to have cheated on his wife. Bless you. Um, the, the medical advice would have nothing to do with the character of the person. So keep in mind, and this certainly would kind of happen probably like in political statements and things like that. Campaign ads would be a great example of ad hominem where you're attacking character of a person but you're, that has nothing to do with the actual argument. Now, could there be some times when the character of a person is significant to how we would view him or her? Absolutely. Um, but if you were to attack someone's argument, do a refute, a rebuttal um, against a position, you couldn't simply go, nope, Steinbeck doesn't know what he's talking about. I mean, he wrote The Grapes of Wrath or The Pearl. Those books weren't any good. His argument would be totally so if you do attack someone else's argument, you'd be attacking the logic of the argument, not just the person, the character. Any questions with any of them? Sense. Like, so, Makes in, sense. In the scale of no water, argument with that. Like, in terms of water, yeah. in terms of like, <laughs> the wettest one we've had. In terms of water, inherently. I mean, he, is it wrong? Ben, don't. But like, who's saying that? Like, so last year for question number three on the AP exam, they didn't really have a good transition. So we go with it. In terms of English, English, language. English language and composition. Uh, this one says at the top, question three, and uh, so their uh, question two is a rhetorical analysis. The first question is a synthesis, which you know, we'll get into all that stuff later. You can answer the questions in whatever order you want. Um, so it's not that, okay, for your first 40 minutes, you have to answer the first question. Now everyone is going to move to question number two. You can answer questions whatever order you decide that you want to go with. So as you're looking over the prompts, this one speaks to you. Ooh, I want to write about this one right now you would have the ability to do that. Um, you have a two hour chunk when it comes to writing your essays. They will give you some verbal cues. Uh, 40 minutes have passed and 40 minutes are left. So it's not that, all right, you have two hours to go. You lose track of time. Time's up, close your book. Oh, so on the first question. They'll go 40 minutes have passed. You should probably be moving on to question number two. 40 minutes are left. You should be moving on to your final question. But if Kate decides you want to spend 15 minutes on the rhetorical analysis, because that's just going to be necessary. And you can do your other two essays in 35 minutes to make up for those lost that, that extra 10 minutes. You have that ability to do that. So it's not you're under the gun. Stop writing. Move on to the next question. If you need a little bit more time or you're done early, with one question to move on to, uh, to the next one. But obviously, you can't go beyond those two hours. Then two hours and five minutes, no, they're not going to do that. Whether you have a waterfall background or so looking at it, don't worry about like the prompt yet. What's different about this one compared to the Huxley Orwell one from uh, from '97 that you were truly like bombed? There's no like long passage. Yeah, there's not a big lengthy passage, and and chances are yours would probably be more like this uh, as opposed to having a, a lengthier passage. You still, they've never said we're not going to do that anymore, um, and they've had some where there's you know like a paragraph maybe that you'd be taking a look at. It's been a while since they've had a DRQ though where like text was in two columns with the line numbers. 
similar to how the uh, uh, Orwell Huxley one was or anything quite near what the, uh, the Conrad PWK that you had was. So the good thing for that is generally it's a much more direct as to what is it that you're going to write about. They are leaving less interpretation for you to figure it out. Now, you had to read the article to really know what Huxley's argument was, Orwell's argument was. Now, they pretty much just come up and, and let you know what it is. One other thing to remind you of, notice it says here in parentheses, this question counts for one-third of your total essay score. All three questions are of equal value. Um, I think uh, in, I don't, I don't know how the U.S. government goes with the, the politics or not, but like if you're an A push or if you did world history last year or Euro, some questions are worth more than others, like the BBQ was worth more. Um, you guys know if it's a politics? I might be completely wrong. I feel like the AP Gov has more like short answer type things as opposed to the full blown. It's definitely like with the world history, the US history, you can tell where this one we want more, or these we want fewer questions. The DBQ for, really more. I don't know if Gov has a DBQ though. I have no idea. It might. I'm not going to pretend that I don't. Um, but for, for our purposes, all three questions exactly the same amount. So it's not that, all right, I really need to focus on the rhetorical analysis because this is where I'm going to make my money on the score. They're all exactly the same. Each essay is going to be 18.3333333 to infinity percent. When you add them all together, you get 55% for, uh, for the essays. So in her book, Gift from the Sea, author and aviator Anne Morrow Lindbergh writes, we tend not to choose the unknown, which might be a shock or a disappointment or simply a little difficult to cope with, and yet it is the unknown with all its disappointments and surprises that is the most enriching. So essentially this has taken the place of the passage that we were looking at the other day. Now we have pretty much just one statement. Consider the value Lindbergh places on choosing the unknown, then write an essay in which you develop your own position on the value of exploring the unknown. Use appropriate, specific evidence to illustrate and develop your position. So, whereas for the one from um, 97, it said contemporary society, this is just going use appropriate, specific evidence. So we could go contemporary society, we could go with historical evidence, we could go with personal examples, we could pretty much go with anything that is going to be appropriate to illustrate our position as to whether or not we agree or disagree with her whole point. So what are our initial reactions to the unknown and the value that would be placed on it? Um, I have a specific example. Um, well, which, okay, what's your example though? Like, or, are you in support of her? Halfway? In the middle? I am. Totally against? I am, I am fully on board with what she said. All right, so you're defending. You're agreeing. Yeah. All right. What's your example? Um, I don't, I, this might be reading into too much, but like when Christopher Columbus, he went and he thought he found Japan or he found, thought he found India or something. And that might have been disappointing. I think it was China. Did he thought he found yeah, it, I, it was it was something. You know. He was because he, he did. He was looking yeah. for India and found the West Indies. Yeah, that's why he called it India. Yeah. No, he found. He found the West. In fourteen ninety two, he sailed the ocean blue. He found the West. He is correct. Keep going. I don't. I don't know. I mean, mean, although although what he what like he, he was disappointed because he did not actually find a passage to figure out. He did find. Well, but okay, let's, and, and so here's the one, and, and here's issue that I could see people doing, and not saying that you would write this, because, you know, the, we're just talking about ideas and we're brainstorming, and I think this is a valid example that you could go with. Um, we tend to choose the unknown, which might be a shock or a disappointment, or simply a little difficult to cope with, and yet it is the unknown with all its disappointments and surprises that is most enriching. Um, this is really probably, I would say, the main point that you would be deciding. Are you going to defend, refute, qualify? Um, and so if, if you were to do something like a qualify, you could say she's right most of the time. And you could come up with an example where this is when she's not right. But generally speaking, you know, Columbus and all these other folks that we might start to mention would be supportive of it. 
Um, what would be the unknown aspect that he would be dealing with? Anything west of Portugal. So, <laughs> basically, the whole navigation, yeah. <laughs> where am I, where am I going, that kind of thing would be an unknown. Am, am I going to make it? You know, will, will I be someone who is, is, is going to be able to survive? Um, I don't know overall. I have a hope, but I don't know destination. Um, I probably don't know all the full dangers of being on the sea. Um, what are some of those dangers? You know, you could be shipwrecked. You could have illnesses taking place. So there's certainly a lot of unknowns with the whole trip that would take place. When it's all said and done, why would that end up being an enriching experience? Whether it be for Columbus or whether it be for other people in general. And we don't have to sell this as this is why Columbus was a great man. By all accounts, he was probably a dirty scoundrel of a, of a person. Uh, he found his way to touch it. Okay, so like new lands discovered then? I was going to say he discovered a new culture. Okay, so we have new, so we have access to knowledge that was not there before, even if, hey, I'm in India. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm in now what we're going to call the West Indies. Hello, Indians. So we have exposure to new cultures, new lands discovered. Plus, also now, what starts to happen after this trip by Columbus? Other people start coming. Other people start coming. And then we could get into more dirty, rotten scoundrels who we now put, you know, on pillars as, hey, those kind of pieces Good job. Forget about the, the people that you deal with and all that stuff. Um, but you could certainly now start to mention the Magellans, the Cabots, the Franklins, the Drakes, all of those folks where it led to advanced knowledge, more information, more experience, all of those kinds of things. So yeah, Columbus would be good. The problem would be if you and your body paragraph were to say, a perfect example of this would be Christopher Columbus. But if you don't mention what was the enrichment that came from it, what were the dangers of the unknown, then your argument's not going to have that specific evidence. So Sam could mention Columbus, Anna could mention Columbus, you could get a two, she could get a nine. You still have the same idea in your head, but if the thought process isn't fully explained, you're not going to get the, the benefit of the question. Could you write your entire paragraph on Christopher Columbus? You could. Or entire um, essay, sorry, entire essay. No, I wouldn't go entire essay. I would, because um, what, like, basically, if, if we were to come up with a category of uh, to, that Christopher Columbus would fall into, what could we call that? Like the way we talk about iPhones being technology and stuff with Orwell and Huxley, what would be a category that Columbus would, would kind of fall into? You could, you could go, I think we could get a little bit more specific. Like, it would be a historical example for sure. New world exploration. New, like, so explorers. You know, even it doesn't have to be New World necessarily. You could go New World. But I think if you were to talk about explorers in general, what are you looking for? You're trying to find something new. So with that thought in mind, and, and Sam, I'm going to bring this back to your question, but I want to try to come up with some others here. Who would be other explorers that you would then think of that would fit this bill where their journeys into the unknown ended up being enriching? And it, it can be New World, then, since you mentioned that. But by keeping it just explorers, we don't have to go with just that, that set of people. Uh, okay, that definitely would not be New World so far as, um, you know, what we're talking like 16th, 17th century. But it's certainly going to still be New World. So, um, Actually, he was on the he was just Yeah, Armstrong. Aldrin. Buzz Aldrin and Neil Grassman. I have no idea. There's a guy who stayed. He was like the but yeah, there's three. On the ship. Aldrin. A L D. Is it Ian? R I N. R I N. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Does it sure. Have to be exclusively like a, a, a disappointing event or like. Wait, wouldn't that be could that be disagree? Well, hold, hold on. Let's let's do a couple things here because we got and, and I think that's a really good point. Yeah, it is it is unknown with all its disappointments and surprises that is the most exciting. So when you when you venture into the unknown, 
generally speaking, not worried about Apollo 13 quite at this point, when you venture into the unknown, there, there certainly can be some disappointment because you have the bar set up here, and sometimes this happens. He thought he made it to India. This is wonderful. I finally found that passage, you know, to get from Portugal all the way around to India. No, you didn't. But it still ended up being a worthwhile, enriching experience, you know, for, for civilizations. Um, going to the moon, certainly there would be unknown, and, and there could be disappointment so far as the trip might not be very successful. And if it's not successful, you're dead. You're probably dead. Um, but it was certainly still kind of worth the, the cost. And, and certainly, people would have been ridiculing the idea of going to the moon. There's no way we can do this. I mean, JFK was big. You know, part of his whole, and, and obviously not president at the time, we are going to get there. We're going to beat the Russians to the moon. It will be difficult, but it will be great when, when we get there. Um, so there was certainly still disappointment, maybe, in the amount of time that it took to get to the moon in 1969. But it still ended up being worthwhile for space program and, and things like that. Apollo 13 is a disappointment in the sense that the mission was not a success. They did not get to the moon. But what was a success? They survived. They survived. And with a whole host of issues and problems, they were able to, you know, kind of problem solve, come up with a way to get those astronauts back. So it's still an enriching experience so far as um, we know that we have the capabilities that in the worst of times, we can still, if not accomplish what we set out to do, there can certainly still be some measurable pluses, benefits to, to the trip in general. Um, you know, we talk about uh, Aristotle and what not saying with science. What is science all about, for the most part? Failing. And through those failures, you then tend to discover, you know, stuff. Um, so the whole idea about, you know, um, you could certainly take a look at, uh, well, venturing into the unknown, you know, you mentioned space, you could put in, you know, Hawking, the um, whole idea about just uh, Galileo. What's Galileo? What was his argument? Uh, we revolve yeah, around the moon, or, yeah, around the moon, that would be right. <laughs> we revolve around the sun. It was a total change with the way that people viewed science. Um, so it was unknown. What were the shortcomings? He was being ridiculed for it. But in the end, it ended up being an enriching experience for not necessarily just him, but all scientists, you know, kind of down the road. So you, Apollo 13, yes, you could definitely use, Maria. Your question was, would that be like a disagreement with it? Or I think it was what you were asking. Like, if, if I go with something like that, am I in disagreement? If, if I don't... It, it could certainly vary in the way you want to explain it. That ver you know, going into the unknown is going to leave people disappointed. <laughs> you know, um, but I, I think it would probably depend upon your your angle that you're going along with it. That there can be a surprising and, and enriching moment in failure. Um, you could kind of qualify it where initially I would disagree with her because he had to have been bummed <laughs> that he wasn't there. The Apollo 13 astronauts had to be bummed that they did not accomplish the mission. They had a chance to go to the moon to be one of only a handful of folks who have ever done it, and they did it. But when you look back on those failures, then you start to realize, hey, that, that could be an enriching experience, something that ended up being worthwhile. This is a stretch, so I certainly would not write this. I did not pass my AP exam. It was a failure. But it's good for Sam. It's good for Bethany. It's good for Cade. It ends up being an enriching experience 20 years later because now I can help them pass their AP exam as I live vicariously through their successes. So, you know, you could kind of take a look at initially this is the reaction that some folks would have, but in the long run, this is why it ends up being a good thing. So there's, there's certainly multiple ways that, that you would be able to go. But I, I would expect, not that you would have to, I would expect that a lot of explorers would be mentioned. You said, could I write a whole paragraph about Columbus? I think, knowing that you have 40 minutes, I think you could make like Columbus your primary example, and you explain this is why it would be an enriching experience, even though it was maybe a failure in some ways. Yeah. If you followed that up with, and other explorers have had similar you know, instances, Pizarro, Magellan, Ponce de Leon, and even Armstrong and Aldrin in a more modern sense, 
because you've established your train of thought with Columbus, the reader would give you credit for those folks as well. If you simply went in your paragraph, a lot of explorers have had difficulty, but it proved out to be good. Columbus, Armstrong, Magellan, you haven't explained it quite as much. But in 40 minutes, there's no way you could go into a specific detail with Columbus and Drake and Magellan and Pizarro and Cabot and Armstrong and Aldrin. You'd be stuck in one paragraph and spend your whole time. But if, if you've established the validity of your argument enough, you could kind of piggyback those additional people off of it. It still count as multiple examples, but your details would really be revolving around that initial one. How would you disagree with this? Like, what would, it, what would be a good example of a disagreement? Um, I, I think, dodging your question, I bet most people agree with it. I mean, I have no idea what the statistical breakdown was for last year. Um, do you have an answer to this question? Yes. Okay. Right. So remember yesterday we were talking about love and how it's an emotion and we explore it. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, at the same time, you can now not say it can be contradicted as being enriching, but at the same time, love can destroy some evil when you explore it. I mean, yeah, you could, I, my, my guess is it would probably be more along those lines where I was going to say personal examples if you've had circumstances with that. Um, you could, um, if, and, and whether you agree or disagree, you're not going to have the definitive evidence that this is why everyone should think that way. But if you were going along the lines of like Apollo 13 and you were coming up with disasters that happened, um, you know, building the greatest steamship of all time, you know, something like Titanic, dealing with the tragedy of, of Apollo 13, um, Challenger, uh, first grade, where did they all take us? <laughs> we were all huddled in the cafeteria watching on the TV as chat 1986. <laughs> You never saw teachers so quickly change a channel and put on Scooby-Doo uh, once they, they realized what was going on. Do um, I don't remember. I, 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 rem I remember going down to the cafeteria to watch it. I don't remember a whole lot about it. I do remember, because there was a science teacher. Um, one of the big things, this is why all the schools are big with it, is you had a civilian a science teacher. I don't remember her name. Um, going on the space shuttle. So that was the big thing. I, I don't remember seeing her go on, but I remember that she had blue eyes. That was yeah. so sad. One blue that way, one blue that way. Oh, I forgot about that one. That's a good one. Mr. Ah. Washington told us that one last year. <laughs> it's not fine, Mr. Kane's body. So. It's okay, Anna. You can be my head. <laughs> so you, you, could use, you could use those, those kinds of personal tragedies, I would say, as an example for it. Um, you, if any, like, how about current examples? Like, what, are, what would be exploration that's trying to take place? I don't want to say exploration, because I don't want to make it seem like we have to go with, with those things. Um, Hillary Clinton ran for president to try to break the glass ceiling, and although she won a popular vote, she didn't win the presidency, mm -hmm. but she also sparked, like, a Democratic social revolution. So, okay, I, let me go with the term revolutions here then for, for, for a second, and, and we can kind of go from it because I, I think the Clinton example would be a good one where you could use that as this is why um, going into the end, do you know that you're going to win the presidency? No. Does it end up being worthwhile, a good thing that you went through that? Some people would say yes. I'm sure there would be some people going, no, it ended up not being you know, worthwhile. But if you think of revolutions, um, you could, uh, you know, what were revolutions that people were sparking that we were hoping that some kind of change would take place? And going back to your original question, Ben, you know, could you disagree with it? Well, revolutions that didn't work. You were talking about famous photos. Like the second one that you mentioned was the guy standing in front of tank. the tank at Tiananmen Square in, in Beijing in, I think that was 1989. Um, that revolution, it didn't really work. It didn't go as far as they were hoping that it would. Um, you know, certainly there have been uprisings in, in multiple countries over you know the last decade that have not worked. Where you still might have in a, in a, 
uh, totalitarian or a dictatorship that is squashing, you know, those rebellions down. So those could be examples where you could, you know, go, you know, in some circumstances, it's probably not worth it. You have to take in your environmental surroundings, political surroundings, where a person could go with that. At the same time, you could go with revolutionaries, Clinton, Barack Obama, first African American president. Um, you could certainly go probably as far back as 1770s. What was the big unknown? For democracy. Washington and Jefferson and Adams and Franklin. We're going to break free from King George. Is this going to work? I don't know. Let's find out. You know, and, and you go to war. It could have ended badly, and it did for a lot of people, you know, with lives lost. But uh, 200 plus years later, we're going, well, we're sure glad they did that. You know, and, and hence you have the country that we have now, and now you can take AP government politics since there's now a U.S. government. Uh, so revolutions or, or rebels would probably uh, be a good area to kind of look at as well. You could have explorers. There we go. You could have revolutionaries. And the same thing, you know, Sam, going back, could, could I build um, a whole paragraph around one person? No, I don't think you could build a whole, you know, thing just on saying um, Hillary Clinton or Jefferson or someone else. But if you then started mentioning all of these folks, like you go into detail about one and then you include a host of others, then there the understanding would certainly be there. Um, you could take a look at art. What changes constantly? Art. I knew that was going to be the answer. What are forms of art that are constantly in evolution? Music. All of those things. And so, you know, you, you could be taking a look at something as, as uh, simple as the evolution of rock music in the 1950s. No one's going to listen to this. You could take a look at the beginning of hip hop and rap in like 1979, 1980. This isn't going to go anywhere. You could be taking a look at evolutions of specific artists. You know, um, uh, Taylor Swift now is different from Taylor Swift seven or eight years ago. Uh, and so you could certainly take a look at how there's a change. You're going into the unknown of a different genre. Is there going to be some fan alienation? Is there going to be more fan support? You know, and you could kind of take a look at those arguments. The evolution of writing, um, the evolution of language, of, of communication. If you were to talk to someone, you know, 50 years ago that will use their little handheld devices and, and, and Sam won't text me when he's going to be late for home room. Um, that's not how we would communicate. So those kind of changes in pop culture would be stuff that you could take a look at. 3D movies, um, color TV. I remember our first VCR. From our, I remember that more than Challenger from when we got a VCR where we could actually like record stuff. Um, so those kinds of evolutions would be things that you could take a look at. Um, athletics, you know, change in sports, safety, and, and whatnot. Is this going to change the game too much um, if we do rule changes to protect Kate's head, you know, when he's participating in, in athletics to avoid concussions and, and stuff like that? Um, so I think you would have a lot of topics that you would be able to, to pull from. My guess is, I'm just going to put like culture, arts. My guess is, Ben, back to your original thing. I think most people probably end up agreeing with it. Um, just because so much probably of what you learn about in school, history, science classes, whatever the heck it is that I talk about all year long, we usually talk about people who have kind of like made changes. Um, civil rights, you know, in, in mentioning about, you know, Hillary Clinton so far, uh, you know, as, as a, that glass ceiling and trying to break it, you could certainly, you mentioned Martin Luther King Jr., you know, with your photos, you know, the unknown for the fights for equality, what's going to happen at these rallies, what's going to happen. When, when the march on Washington is, is going to take place, in the end, does it end up being worth it? You know, are there significant changes being made? Yes. So you could have Columbus, Galileo, Taylor Swift, Armstrong, all working kind of together in one essay. The main thing is coming up with those arguments, coming up with the evidence. If you simply went science, art, history shows us that yes, this is true, 
but you don't get into the specifics, that argument's not really going to go anywhere. So it's all about having those specific examples. And that's the tricky part. It's easier when you have 13, 14 people talking about it, and you know, Maria throws in an idea, Zach has an idea, Ben has an idea. It's tougher when it's you and the piece of paper. Um, but if you can come up with those general subsets first, I do think you can get specific people. Or examples, it doesn't have to be people. Uh, two articles for tomorrow. First thing we'll do is reading check quiz. Um, remember, it's 10 questions, multiple choice, five on the first article, five on the second. Should be pretty uh, straightforward. And then we're going to talk about the, the articles. Um, we're going to look for, are there any logical fallacies that you notice within the articles? How would you evaluate their arguments? Not do you agree or disagree. It's not going to be a DRQ, which article is better. Um, but what are our pluses and minuses about both of them?